So what is Illuminism? Who is an Illuminist? I claim no special authority, but I'll offer my thoughts on this question. To answer this, I have to make a distinction between Gnostics and what I'll call Pistics. Of course, Gnosis means knowledge, and Pistis means faith. Gnostics are those who have attained knowledge, and Pistics are those who have adopted beliefs. Gnosticism is a set of beliefs based on the knowledge communicated by the Gnostics, but Gnosticism isn't Gnosis, and Illuminism isn't Illumination. Illuminism is a description of a sunrise given to a blindfolded person, and it may be the most perfect possible description of the sunrise that can be given, but it's still a description. The blindfolded person to whom this beautifully accurate description is given may ask for proof that the description is accurate. And maybe the person giving the description is able to give the blindfolded person all sorts of solid philosophical arguments, scientific evidence, and even mathematical proof that his description is accurate. And so the blindfolded person becomes an illuminist. If you ask him about the sunrise, he can tell you about it in great detail. And if you challenge him to prove that what he says is true, he can offer solid arguments defending his position. He can tell other blindfolded people about the sunrise, and they can become illuminists too. And it isn't just blind faith. They've based their beliefs on reason and evidence. It isn't that their beliefs are untrue. Illuminism is true but it isn't illumination. Illumination is removing the blindfold. Illumination is witnessing the sunrise. In the light of direct experience, descriptions vanish. One who has seen the sunrise is an illuminatus. I don't want anyone to think that I'm putting down illuminism. I don't want anyone who calls himself an Illuminist to think that I'm insulting him. I'm not. This would be like putting down a great poem written by a master poet, or criticizing someone who is inspired by his poetry. My concern is that Pistics have a tendency toward ideological rigidity and authoritarianism. This is the inevitable consequence of an overemphasis on description rather than direct experience. Gnostic teachers fall into this trap as well, when they focus too much on describing reality to Pistics instead of leading Pistics into a direct experience of reality. I'm not a relativist. There is ultimately one reality. But there are a near infinite number of ways to attempt to describe that reality. And there are a near infinite number of ways to interpret each of those near infinite number of descriptions. Infinite division over which interpretation is correct is the inevitable result. And by infinite division, I mean infinite multiplication of warring factions. E unum pluribus. This is the destiny of any community founded on description, founded on Illuminism. The alternative is a community founded on Illumination. When we share in the direct experience of reality, the result is unity. You see the sunrise, and you're inspired to paint a beautiful painting. Another sees the same sunrise, and she's inspired to write a beautiful poem. Yet another sees the same sunrise and is inspired to compose a sublime piece of music. Does the poem contradict the music? Or does it provide the song with lyrics? The Illuminatus is not a fruit which grows from the tree of Illuminism. Illuminism is the fruit which grows on the tree of the Illuminati. And it's my sincere desire that every man and woman should taste that fruit, so that their eyes may be opened, 
and that they may become like gods. If I describe the way the fruit tastes to them, I don't do so in order that they may be satisfied by the mere description, but in order that they may be tempted to taste it for themselves. I describe the beauty of the sunrise in order that those who are blindfolded may desire to remove their blindfolds. And so I think Illuminism is beneficial only if it leaves a person unsatisfied and causes them to desire illumination, and harmful if it leaves him satisfied in the belief that he is already illuminated. And so I consider the true Illuminist to be the person who finds himself or herself dissatisfied with Illuminism and who aspires toward illumination. If such individuals formed a community, I doubt they would place much importance on agreeing upon or establishing an orthodox description of reality and persecuting heretics. Instead, the emphasis would surely be on practices and disciplines intended to prepare the individual to receive illumination. But of course, the majority of men and women are too lazy to undergo the physical, mental, and spiritual training and preparation required. Much is required of those to whom much is given. To whom little is given, little is required. Not much is required of the pistic. He has only to adopt the belief system. A great deal more is required of the Gnostic. He must persevere along the path of initiation. The majority of people have always been pistics. They cling to their beliefs instead of seeking knowledge. And so it's better that they should hold true beliefs rather than false beliefs. And so to replace Abrahamism with Illuminism is a noble goal for the Illuminism community to pursue. But in addition to that, I want to encourage those within the Illuminism community not to be satisfied with Illuminism, but to pursue the additional noble goal of illumination and to avoid the danger of confusing one for the other. Avoid the danger of ideological dogmatism. Remember that a house divided against itself cannot stand, and if your roof caves in and your walls crumble, how will you offer shelter to the homeless? And that concludes my sermon. But I'd like to end with a story. This story began long ago, in a land far away. Humanity had fallen into slavery and was ruled over by the Archons, who conspired to keep them in a state of ignorance regarding their true nature and origin. Lucifer and his army, the Angels of Light, disguising themselves as Archons, covertly infiltrated the Kingdom of Darkness and secretly recruited and illuminated a small number of enslaved humans. However, because eyes accustomed to darkness require time to slowly adjust to the light, the angels were forced to devise means by which to enlighten them by degrees. Having reached a certain stage of illumination, these individuals began to work to spread the light throughout the world. The Archons became aware of this conspiracy to overthrow them and sought to eliminate these illuminated ones who posed a threat to their power and control over humanity. And so the Illuminati broke into splinter cells in order to escape destruction. Although they found it necessary to blend in among the slave population, the Illuminati were able to recognize one another by the light within them. But those who had only achieved the lower levels of illumination lacked this degree of perception, and so they were given signs by which to identify themselves to each other. Different groups of recruits were given different signs which were exclusive to their own group. In this manner, the true Illuminati were able to remain invisible, and yet to continue to operate through multiple visible shell organizations. These shell organizations, however, being visible, were vulnerable to being infiltrated and corrupted by the Archons. And the Archons quickly discovered that, once hijacked, these organizations could become extremely powerful weapons of deception and mind control. They would retain the superficial symbols and myths, 
but would present them in a distorted way in order to conceal the forbidden knowledge they had been intended to progressively reveal. And they would present them as literal truths, rather than as symbols, myths, and allegories. They created hierarchical structures within the organizations, and positions of authority within the organizations were given as rewards to those with whom the Archons were pleased. And in their desire for authority and status within the organizations, men who once desired to escape and free others from their captors fell again under their control, and those who had been entrusted with the keys to the prison doors were offered the role of prison guards. This seems like an appropriate place to end the story for now, although this is certainly not the end of the story. <laughs>